John 9. I say this in the context of 1 Samuel 2, so I'm going to read this guy right here based on the conversation I had with my son this morning. Now the boy Samuel was ministering, 1 Samuel 3, to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the words of the Lord, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision, showing you that visions can contain the word of the Lord. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Samuel was lying in the Holy of Holies or the holy place, one of the two. He was actually sleeping there. That's cool. Earlier on, Joshua did similarly because he did not depart from the presence of the temple. This is written in the Torah. Mm -hmm. Now, something y'all should know, Samuel was a teacher. He was not a mercy. He was not <clears throat> a prophet. He was not an exhorter. He was a teacher. In order for a teacher to have full effectiveness, they have to have an encounter or a series of encounters with the Lord that break them from their religiosity. Religious spirit, in its broadest definition, is a spirit that coaches you to do everything except the one thing the Lord is leading you to do, which means you can end up engaging in a flurry of religious activity, including flagging, worship, speaking in tongues, prophesying, the whole nine yards, and the Lord is trying to lead you to a place of justice. Isaiah, the teacher, said... Early on in his book, you know, you pervert justice and this, that, and the other, and we want justice for the widows and the orphans and the fatherless. They were of, The nation of Israel was avoiding doing the one thing the Lord asked them to do and was multiplying new moon feast festivals, the feast of the Lord, etc., whether it was tabernacles, Hanukkah, Sukkot, whatever the case, Purim, and the Lord was done because they were celebrating all the right calendar of feasts, Hello, sacred cow, make the best hamburger, because we're so obsessed with whether or not we're celebrating the Jewish feasts. And Adonai is saying, Hashem is saying, what are you doing with justice? Matthew 23, 23, you tithe, woe to you Pharisees, hypocrites, mint, dill, and cumin, but you're neglecting the weightier matters of law. Huh? That's what I read this morning. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Yeah, the... The, what do you, the seven woes. The seven woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin. See, I know. This is my spirit. Knows where you are, dear. Knows how to reach you where you are. These things you ought to have done without neglecting the former. There's a place for tithing, whatever that looks like. However, the Lord wants to structure that for each of us. But he also wants us in the context, he wants us to frame tithing in the context of executing three things. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. Justice, we are supposed to not abridge for these people. Mercy, when somebody <coughs> screws up and admits their flaw, we say, okay, let's work with this and coach you and help you and love on you, lead you to a better place. And faithfulness, you're steadfast by those people, even when they are not steadfast to you. So, taking these truths into John 9. As he passed by, he saw a man born blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, meaning teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus was not concerned with who sinned. Jesus said, No, nobody sinned. Guys, y'all missing. There's a deeper point. Sometimes the trouble or the blindness comes to somebody from birth specifically so the Lord can show himself strong and faithful and mighty and great in somebody's life. 
sometimes blindness becomes a stage for the works of God to be displayed using our lives. We must work, verse 4 of John 9, we must work the works of him who sent me while it was day. Jesus is speaking to his followers there. We all of us, together, as a group, as a team, as a tribe, as a gang. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground, he spit on the ground, and made mud with the saliva. Then using that saliva and mud, making clay, he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. <clears throat> a creative miracle, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is that, this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. And others said, No, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were you, your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. That wash is for the Pennsylvanians in the crowd. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who, was for, who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes because Jesus was looking to pick a fight with the Pharisees who were walking in their religious spirit, doing everything except the one thing that the Lord asked them to do, which was... Walk in justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Matthew 23, 23. Some of the Pharisees said, so... Blah, 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 blah. Okay, verse 15. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Wrong. He doesn't keep our interpretation of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It was a tool and an asset and a resource given to man, not a burden. Not man for the Sabbath. Man was not made to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to serve man. The Sabbath was made as a tool for man to utilize, to be rest, rested and refreshed, to ponder what's happened in the week to hear from Father what went well, what went wrong during the week, to meditate, to pull truth, to pull principles and say, oh, these are tools that I can apply to get revelation from the Lord so we can walk with him in the cool of the day. He does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, The blind man said, He's a prophet. The Jews do not believe, did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How does, then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, He is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents were doing everything to, to skirt the issue, not confront head on, because they knew anybody <clears throat> should confess Jesus they were thrown, going to be thrown out of the synagogue. Verse 22. That was a paraphrase of it. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. He said, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I see. And they said, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, said, 
You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God has spoken, has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man said, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, those who persist in sin, not those who screw up, but those who defiantly persist in sin. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus didn't stop people from worshipping him as God. He is fully God. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world that those who may see those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? The lamp from First Samuel 3 was going out. Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, verse 41, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt <laughs> remains. And also your blindness our responsibility is to take the light that he's given to us and to steward and manage that light and not to castigate others as, as blind or seeing, but to help them if they are blind to see. Our responsibility is to see to it that the light of God is multiplied. Jesus said in this passage, he's the light of the world. He said in Matthew 5 that we are the light of the world. Which means he, the light of the world, is dwelling in us. And as a result, we are actually the light of the world. We are the city that is set on a hill. We were the light that's put on the stand. Isaiah, who I talked about earlier, said, They will be drawn to your glory. You, period. Your glory, humans who are believers and followers of the Lord, people will be drawn mm -hmm. to our glory. Our responsibility is to make sure that our lenses and glass and windows are clean, that our lamps are trimmed and dressed, and that we have plenty of oil. Oh, oil. We can't rely on other people's oil. Other people have a limited supply. We can't dip into somebody else's reserves. Our responsibility. Be his light. Pam, go ahead. No, I think a lot of people in the church rely on their pastor and their worship leader and um, other leaders in the church's oil. And their parents or their brothers or their friends. Yep, a lot of kids rely on their parents or their grandparents' oil. And we have to rely on our own oil. That The parable of the virgins where five had the oil and had extra oil with them and the other five did not um, and they had to go buy oil and they were cast out they didn't have the oil they were relying on somebody else um, yeah. it's a really dangerous spot to be in we need our own oil our own relationship with God our own um, our own filling of the Holy Spirit yeah and 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 that, and that intimacy where we can turn to him and learn even baby steps, the ways to hear from him. Um, and it, there, there's a discipleship process and sanctification process, but it's there, there are processes, and, and every person can achieve that. Um, it's not an exclusion thing. You know, there are times when some of y'all ask me, kids... I can't hear God. How do I hear God? I don't know. How do I pray? And I say to you, as a man speaks to his friend, if I am able to speak to you on a friend level and on a father level, 
and you can hear my voice and you do what I say. You've heard something. So, application here as you pray. Open your mouth and say, Lord, help me to hear. Open my eyes so that I can see. I need the wick, I need the oil, and I need the lamp in my life. And I need it burning constantly. This is a prayer that you can pray very simply. Lord, I need your lamp. And you can go through it just like that. Gang who's listening out online, who will, read, who will listen to this and watch this in the future, I bless each of you to speak to the Lord about your lamp, the status of your lamp, where it is, and to ask him to relight it if it needs to be relit, regardless of the circumstances. And that you, he will answer that prayer guaranteed as you pray it. Because he wants your light shining. Jesus said in Matthew 5, let men see your light shine. If your light ain't shining and you ask the Lord to help it shine, he's going to answer it because he wants your light to shine. Because he wants all men to be drawn unto him. The only way he get, they get drawn unto him, or one of the major ways they get drawn unto him, is because the light shines in us. So it's a guaranteed prayer that the Lord is going to answer if we ask him, please give me the lamp and light it. This is something you can only get yourself from him, which means you have to physically open your mouth up and ask him. Lord, we ask for your lamp. And Lord, I ask that you would help my sons and my daughter open their mouths up and say, Lord, give me your lamp and light it. So that I can have the revelation and the illumination that comes as I read your word and the application comes and I can feel the light bulb come on. Lord, turn on the light. Do you have anything else to add, my love? Sure. Psalm, um, as a directly related uh, verse, thy what is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path? A lot? It's a verse. In Psalm, thy blank is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I don't know. Okay. What was the verse called? It's in Psalm somewhere. Psalm 119. Your blank. It's 105, I think. Your blank is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Fill in the blank. The 105 or 110. Your word. The word. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God is our first way to, that he communicates with us. Because a new believer is not going to be able to just hear the inner prompting of the, of the Lord necessarily. Some do. But the first way you hear God is to learn who he is. We read the word. What are we reading? We're reading who the living word Jesus is, uh, the Father, Holy Spirit. We get to know who they are. We get to know what their principles are. We get to know how some people have done it well and how some people messed it up badly. We get a whole bunch of examples to follow. Then we get a whole bunch of examples to um, use as, uh, no, no, don't go there. There's, there's so much in the word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. If you're not sure you know the way, that's the book you need to be relying on. It is the most important book to me um, for you to get the principles you need to be a son, not a slave, not just a, hey, here's a bunch of rules, I'm going to follow the rules and I'm fine. 
He wants us to weave the principles together and be a son. Yeah. And it's it, I, I realize that so much of your lives is um, when I'm an adult, when I'm an adult, when I'm an adult. Well, you know what? Your walk with God is not a when I'm an adult. You can have the, a just as strong walk with God as any adult. You can have a stronger walk with God as any adult at 13, 14. You do not have junior Holy Spirit living inside of you when you have Holy Spirit inside of you. There are principles there. Yeah. And trying to read the book like you're reading a novel is not a great idea. Approach the Lord like he just prayed. Before you open the word, Lord, would you make this a lamp to my feet and a light to my path? Would you illuminate what you're saying to me, how this applies to me, what you want me to do with it? Don't try to read it on your own. You've got a Holy yeah. Spirit inside of you to help you and to speak to you so you can learn how to hear his voice. As you learn how to hear his voice in the word, you'll be able to pray other things and hear his voice. It's, it's so critical. Isaac, do you ever ask Eli for anything? Or Jonah, or Joel, or Joey? Yeah. <clears throat> Tell me something yeah. that you've asked one of them before. Um, asked for, or just a question? Asked for, ask them. Have you ever asked them for anything? Um, one time, Joel got a new game. It was... A uh, new Celtic game, Breath of the Wild, and I asked if I could try it out. There you go. I said, sure. Let me ask you this. If you were to take that approach to prayer, if that were the Lord and he had something that he knew would be life-giving and a blessing to you and you asked for it, you know, you can bar it, use it, steward it, manage it, whatever the case. Do you think he might give you a, a try at that? When I say talk to him like a man speaks to his friend, that's what I mean. Now, you want to talk about practical? Oh, yeah. Lord, may I steward and manage the knowledge so that I can pass this test. One of the gifts the Lord has given a mass is an innate ability to memorize just like me. States and capitals. That's a gift. And yet, if I, I don't know what to pray or how to pray, I don't know what I'm supposed to say or whatever the case, whatever excuses we make, <clears throat> Not just Emmaus, but any of us. He'll listen when you speak. It's not like speaking to an empty room. It's speaking to a room that has three of your best friends present. And they want to talk back. He is speaking. Are you listening? He's running his mouth. The Son of God is an exhorter. Do you think he's got something to say? Oh, yeah. All the exhorters you can name in your life. Our president is an exhorter. He runs his gator on Twitter. Non-blinking stop. Do you think if our Lord is the quintessential exhorter, he has something to say to us? The question is, are we listening? Are we tuned into the frequency? Sometimes we're tuned into static. Lord, help tune me to your frequency so I can hear your voice. Yes. And he will answer that. The question is, are you willing to listen to what he has to say and then apply it? Probably the other caution I would say is don't listen to the unbelievably horrible religious spirit. You can't talk to God that way. You have to come to God in a certain format. You have to use certain words. It's a lie. It's not true. God will hear you and relate to you where you're at. 
Yeah. He will. He he doesn't need these and thous and folded hands and on your face. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with 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 people who, especially an intercessor who intercedes on their face or on their hands and knees or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's also but, nothing wrong with people who use early modern English because they're they're writers and they enjoy the these and thous. Right. But there's also nothing wrong with someone going, yo, you're my friend, and let's have a conversation, and I need you, because that's the way they speak. That's the way their brain flows. That's their, that's their culture. And Lord, this person is sus. Yeah, that just... He's you know. going, he, 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 is, he is aware of the culture and where the culture goes, and he will use the words of you. He is capable of helping you. you know, we're talking about speaking in tongues... The language of each culture, he's adept at it. You know, I mean, obviously we want to be, we don't want to be like disrespectful, but it's, it's, it's about a relationship and a friendship. It really is. It's not, you know, like you're going into church and you have to dress to the nines and, you know, you go to the confessional and talk to the priest. And it's just not like that. He loves you and wants to be in relationship with you. Yeah. Yeah. He's speaking and we listen. Gang, be at peace. We love you. He always is speaking. Even the people who think that the Lord hates them, He is speaking. Period. We love you guys and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.